Hello, welcome to Journeys with Jeff. I'm your host, Jeff Grandy, and we'll get right down to our guest uh, tonight. That we have uh, with us um, a very, very interesting person. Um, I'm sure you'll be uh, you'll be very interested to hear the uh, details about his journey and his life. Uh, Rich Lyon, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Nice, nice. To, ha nice to have you here. Nice to be here. Thanks for being here. We're, we're, tell us, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you were born, you were, you're not a Connecticut boy, where were you born? No, I was born in a, a little town called Bradford, Pennsylvania. And, and where is, is that? Is, the closest major city is Buffalo, New York. You start in Buffalo, start south, as soon as you cross the state line, you're in Bradford, Pennsylvania. It could be snowing right now, it's almost every day. So, so, you, were, so you were like... Uh, I was a hillbilly. A, a small town boy. The, the most famous thing to come out of Bradford, Pennsylvania is Zippo lighters. <laughs> really? Yes, it is their claim to fame. It used to be Kendall Oil, um, but the, the, oil comp, the oil refinery is still there, but they don't make Kendall Oil. They still make oil, but it, the, the brand name of Kendall was sold to another company. So your boyhood memories... Or memories of what, like hunting and going in the I, woods? I kind of lived fishing. in the forest because where I lived actually was, was Gifford, Pennsylvania, which isn't even on most maps. It's, a, it's just a village, and, and it's on top of the hill. Bradford was down the valley. Then if you go down the hill the other way, you, you get to Smithport, which is a, bigger than Gifford. Gifford's only a couple hundred people, and it's, it's just um, a group of houses on the mountain, in the, in the Appalachian Mountains. And we would get bear and things in our backyard and deer. And my mom used to wow. have bird feeders and she would bring the bird feeders in at night so the bears don't knock them down eating the bird feed. So, wow. yeah. And uh, so it, it was interesting. I used to go, growing up, we'd go into the woods and go into like these caves from caverns and just climbing all and do all kinds of things that probably should have gotten us killed, but somehow didn't. Isn't yeah. that, that's so typical of, of young boys and girls when you're young. Yeah, it's yeah a, actually. amazing to look back and think of all the bullets we dodged. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I mean, it's in the Appalachian Mountains. In, in the wintertime, we'd go out sled riding down these big old hills. It, the, the two industries in the area was logging and oil. And so there was dirt roads throughout the, the um, forest that were either from loggers or from oil companies. Well, what was the first big city you saw? Pittsburgh when I joined the Air Force. So oh, well, Buffalo maybe. I, we went up to Niagara Falls as a kid. So when you were, okay, so when you were, how, how old were you when you first saw a big sized city? Well, with my parents, we went to Buffalo a couple times in Niagara Falls, but it was like a day trip. And then when I joined the Air Force, they sent me to Pittsburgh for like a physical and things like that. Were you impressed? With um, the, it must have been impressive to see it, the city. I mean, growing up there in Gifford, it, it seemed like almost like I was in this lost place where, you know, I knew no one in the outside world ever heard of Gifford, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, where as Pittsburgh or New York, everyone's heard of, you know, and, and it's like if, if we disappeared, no one would even notice almost, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> So, all right, now you, uh, you went to high school. Yes, Smithport and, High School. And what was, what was high school like? What did you do? Uh, what, well, what kind of, th what, part, what did you to participate in high school? I, I uh, mostly did art in high school for, for like my thing. I was sort of known as the artist in the class. And um, I was on the high school football team. What position? I was the two small linemen basically I played down the line mostly I sh should have switched to running back but or some other position um but um in I didn't go every year out I didn't go out the first year I had the chance and I went out and then I didn't go out the next year and then I think my junior and senior year I, and then I kind of fallen in love with it but at first it was like eh, I could take it or leave it but um so you were in the varsity Football team, uh, yes. And then when you graduated from high school, well, you did. You went to. You went. Did you play high school? Did you? You went to um, Penn State. Well, what I did, I actually, 
joined the Air Force while I was still in high school. And I oh. went to, yeah, the recruiter came to the school like they do all the schools and gave us a big sales pitch. And I had no idea what I was going to do. So I joined up and I went to basic training two weeks after graduation. So, um, and then I went down, that was in, um, uh, in Texas at uh, um, San Antonio, um, what was it, Lackland Air Force Base. And that, when I got to go out on that town and walk around too, I, I was impressed with, with that, with San Antonio. It was still a big city to me. That I, the only other one I've seen was Buffalo and Pittsburgh. So and high school into the Air Force. Yes. Did you did you travel? Did did you get were you stationed well, overseas anywhere? I spent a year and a half in Okinawa, Japan. How was that? Uh, interesting, I guess. Culture um, must have been. It was different. It, it kind of woke me up because when I joined the Air Force, I had that same brainwashing that most Americans do of America's the best country in the world, and I just assumed that was what everyone on the whole planet thought because I kind of grew up hearing that. But while I was in Japan, I remember I was walking down the street and looking at things, and I started thinking to myself, how is the United States actually better than Japan? I said, it's different. But there are things in Japan that's better than the United States and things in the United States that's better than Japan. So does, you couldn't really clearly say the United States was factually better than Japan. You know? and, and it kind of woke me up a little bit in that respect. Where I think that's kind of a rare uh, epiphany for people to have, but yeah, but yeah, it, the it, realization but, that uh, maybe some of these i some of these ide ideas that have been kind of put into our mind, minds yeah. are not. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I was question them a little bit. It, you know, from all this time, and and I just thought it was clear cut and a fact. You know, I I didn't even think there was a question, but when well, I was just down there, I was like, you know, seeing things that were kind of cool in Japan that. You know, just seemed different than, you know, I say I bought a, a Playboy magazine from a vending machine, which you cannot do in the United States. It was all in Japanese and stuff. So, so it was kind of a novelty <laughs> thing for me for a while, you know. Yeah. And I got the same issue um, in <laughs> the English issue and was in, uh, I helped, kept them for a while. I think I've since lost them, but. Well, how long were you in the Air Force? I did Four years in the regular Air Force, and, and while I was in the Air Force, while I was in Okinawa, Japan, I did a month TDY to Korea. We almost had a, a, a war there. A couple Army, U.S. Army guys got killed by the North Koreans, and we spent a pile of money to fly some planes around and, and rattle sabers, what, what, and I went year, to there. What year would you say? I'd say I went in the Air Force in 75. I graduated in 75. I was in Okinawa until 77. Then I got stationed at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. So I, sometime in between 75 and 77, um, probably about 76 or so. Okay, so you get out of the Air Force. Yeah, then, then, then I went then, back to then Pennsylvania. You went to Penn, then you went to Penn State? I, I yes. I, I, uh, might have found some job for a little while, but then I, I went to a branch campus of Penn State. I wanted to go to the main campus. I wanted to go out for football. And, um, I, but I went to a branch campus first in Dubois, and they kind of trapped me into it and didn't let me onto the main, switch to the main campus. So they kind of screwed me there. Um, and so other than once time going over to the main campus, and, and I was actually lost and walking down a hallway completely lost and guy walking the other way and I recognized him, Joe Paterno. <laughs> and, uh, wow. and I said, oh, Joe, can you tell me where whatever I was looking for is? And he goes, puts his arm on me, yes, yeah, son, you walk down there and then gave me the directions, you know. So that was kind of neat. Um, wow. But I never got to practice with him or play for him. Well, I've got, I've, I've heard that uh, you were, uh, our viewers might not, uh, some of them might not be old enough to remember. Back at was it like in the early '80s? There was a uh, there was the NFL, National Football League, right? And then wasn't there a, a, an AFL? It, it, well, there were some investors yeah. that were going to start a new league. Well, that was called the USFL, the United States Football League. Okay, and you went out, you you well you at that tried time, out, didn't you? At that time, I I was on a semi-pro team, which was really 
a non-pay team. It was really an amateur team. Um, there were several around, and this one was called the New England Crusaders. And some of us tried out for the New Jersey Generals, which was eventually owned by Donald Trump. When I tried out, it was the first year. And I ran the 40 and 4.8, the only time I was ever timed. So it's not bad. You know, it's not like... And you went like, out for running back. Yeah, and they, for some reason, they chose Herschel Walker over me. I'm so you, not sure what their logic so was. So you were, you, were, <laughs> you were beat out? By Herschel Walker. Um, probably more than just Herschel Walker because I'm sure they had some backups. Well, that's but, pretty good company to get beat out by, yeah, though. They, huh? I didn't meet any of them. They came up to Hartford and, and, and we actually, I think it was Hartford High in their uh, uh, football field where they, their coaching staff was putting us through little drills and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they came to see us. So, so I never made the team, but. Um, but you were. You were you spent a good a good amount of time and energy uh, in in pickup football, semi pro football. Yeah, uh, and and some flag football while I was in the air flag force. Flag football and, stuff, and all that. Know, but uh, so your your uh, what brought you? How'd you come to to heart to Connecticut? What brought you to Connecticut? Um, well, I was kind of flunked out of Penn State because I can't spell. I'm dyslexic and uh, and. Uh, Wow, you, Back, you were dyslexic. I'm still dyslexic. <laughs> well, we, it's not like it got better. <laughs> we had a, we had a, uh, the, the viewers may remember, we had a, a last year, one of my guests, uh, Dan Berman, who's now yeah. the producer uh, of, of some of these shows, um, he was born and raised, he's a West Hartford boy, went to Hall High, yeah. and he was uh, uh, on the football team, but he was uh, also dyslexic. Yeah, sometimes and, I say lexistic to me. Yeah, <laughs> but that that must have been so. That's got to be frustrating to, to yeah. I didn't tough know your way through school. I didn't know I was dyslexic, and for quite a few years. And I remember um, when I was like in fifth grade or so, we we're studying Roman numerals, and the teacher was like so impressed during class while talking, you know, and answering questions. Like I was so into it and understood it all. Then we did the test, and I had everything all switched around, and then couldn't figure it out. And no one seemed to put two and two together. Um, but I, I still, the word does and uh, dose. Just switching two letters, I can't tell you which is which. Whenever I type it, I write doesn't. And if I get a red thing saying it's spelled wrong, I switch the two letters or, or I switch the two letters around if I want does. And I back back up the... <laughs> a couple letters, but as, I've gotten in the habit of doing things like that. To, as frustrating as that part. was, must have been, you still, you know, wh wh why not just say, you, the, the heck, the heck, you know, you get out of high school, the heck with college, but you didn't say the heck with college. You went, you've gone, you've gone back to college. You've got yeah. uh, 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 several years of college under your belt. You've had, you've got certificates. Yeah. You've, uh, you've toughed it out. Why didn't you just, with the, with the frustration of being dyslexic, why didn't you just say, the heck with it? Um, I guess I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> um, you just toughed I, it I, out. Well, you know, I, I think that I would have enjoyed school a lot more had we addressed it at a young age, but I didn't know it in my, you know, nobody seemed to know it. And I guess some little school in the Appalachian Mountains doesn't always pick up on things of that nature. So there must have been a lot of the time in your early I years. I thought I was stupid. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. You must have concluded yeah. that, there were, you, that you were stupid when all yeah. the time you weren't. Right. To, to, yeah. All the time. Yeah. All that time you weren't. You were really smart as heck. Oh, I'm smart as a son of a gun. Well, <laughs> you, you, well let's, let's, talk about, let's talk a little bit about that. You, so you, um, uh, you got into stand-up comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna show our, our viewers some of your some of your a little bit of your routine, and uh, it'll be put into the show here. But at any rate, what what uh, how did how did you um, how did you get into well, comedy? It's kind of a long story too. When I was in, well, I was always kind of a class clown, you know. Um, so anyway, when I was stationed in Japan, it seemed like. Every guy in the, in the 
barracks and you know the the air force base with me did the same thing we all bought huge stereo because the stereo was about half the price that you could get in the united states so we bought these high-end hi-fis you know high fidelity analog in those days but you know big speakers and big amps and and uh, i got out of the air force and i was back here living in connecticut and i needed a job and i thought to myself i've got this big stereo and that's like the main thing you need to be a DJ. And I didn't have much money, but um, I thought I might as well just try it, you know. So I um, started off, I put an ad in the Journal and Choir. And that, that day, um, a lot of, you, you know, familiar with the Journal and Choir, it's on the other side of the river, you know, yeah, the yeah. newspaper. <laughs> yeah, a that. lot of D, uh, DJs would advertise in there. And I called them all up and actually got their prices. So then I ran an ad and put myself a couple dollars cheaper than the least expensive one. And I ran the ad and people would call up, how much are you? And tell them, they, okay, thank you. No one hired me. So I put my price in the middle and I started getting work. So then I put my price slightly higher than the, sec than the highest person. So I was the most expensive and I got more work. So, and what I did originally, I only had one turntable, so I would go to a, an, an audio store, buy a turntable and a mixer, because I didn't have a, a proper mixer for being a DJ, use them, then go the next day or after the, my gig, and most were, were weddings, and I was pretty bad at first, but I got pretty good at it. And then I would um, return them and get my money back, because I was just so tight. That's the only way I could pull everything off. But and eventually I started getting more high-end equipment and things. And I did it for a few years and, and I got pretty busy and started running my ads in the yellow pages and, and was able to even make my price even higher. Where, where did you do some, did you do mostly in the Hartford area? Did you yeah. do New York? No, I New mostly York just in the Hartford area. It was mostly clubs, weddings is what fed me. Club, I did a few weddings? nightclubs, but it was Mostly weddings, so I'd be busy all during the summer. Yeah, and I would make pretty decent money. Um, I blew it all back then. But and you, of course, you wrote all your own material. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I did that. You know, when what happened is I decided. Well, I kind of hit a plateau with the DJ thing. It's like, how far can I go being doing being a DJ, doing weddings? I mean, you know, even yeah. though I was making money, yeah. but I had a full time job and doing that. So. I said, you know, and I was kind of a jokester, and, and I thought, I'd like to try stand-up comedy. And I wrote a bit, and um, I went to Billy Jack's Cafe of Comedy. I called them up and asked them how to do it, and they had to open mic. Now, that was a club in Glastonbury, Connecticut, in Fox Run Mall. So I went and did my first thing. I was as nervous as could be my first time. And because I, I, I got to have a couple beers first and I had the beer and I remember the bottle just kind of tapping my teeth. I was like, before going on, I got enough and I got up there and I did, the, did my routine and got a couple laughs and did okay. And I stayed at it for like 10 years, although, but I never got, I'll say, a big break. Um, but I started doing clubs in New York. I actually met Chris Rock before he was famous um, in, in the uh, Comedy Cellar. And... Oh. Uh, and in fact, I think he had already started on Saturday Night Live, but I didn't know because I didn't watch the show Saturday Night Live that much because I, I did my bit and it was like one or so in the morning when I was on. Then he was like a couple comedians behind me. He was funny as hell, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, I, and he got off and, and none of the other comedians would talk to him. They were just like jealous, in my opinion. I walked up to him, shook his hand, said, good set, you know? He goes, thank you, you had a good set too. And we're talking, and, and what was your name? He goes, Chris Rock. He goes, I'm on Saturday Night Live now. And, and I go, oh, I haven't seen that since it was funny. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then I go, all right, I'm just busting on you. I go, I go, and I go, you know, I gave him encouragement. I said, you know, that people from that show become big stars. And I go, and every time they change staff, or, you know, the people say, oh, they're not as funny as the old ones until they get used to them. And, and, that was the case, of course. And he went on to stardom, and good for him. And he went on to stardom, and you went on to... Poverty. Politics. <laughs> well, poverty. Yeah, politics, yeah. poverty. But you... you, you yeah, I decided. Now, yeah. now we ha we're, we're, we're going from semi-pro football to 
to uh, stand up comedy. Yeah, I know. Now we're going to. Uh, you were. There's only a few uh, things politics. I haven't done, I guess. Well, what, 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 well, what, 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 I, the, what after. Um, I actually went back into the Air Force, actually in the Connecticut Air National Guard. I did, after I did my four years in the Air Force, I was out for a few years. I joined, I joined the National Guard and did that for like 10 years. So I got two honorable discharges, actually. One from the Air Force, one from the National Guard. But um, I, I was out by the time I ran for office. But, I, you know, I was watching politics, and, and I, I grew up my family were staunch Democrats, and they still have a picture of John F. Kennedy on the wall back in the house where I grew up in. And, uh, and when I was in the Air Force, you know, I got more associated with a lot of people that were Republican, and so I kind of got a little bit more in the middle. But then I was watching debates with, um, I remember Bush Sr., I think it was, and, and uh, Bill Clinton arguing over who put the most people in jail for marijuana, who was going to be the toughest. And it wasn't like one was saying, I'm going to work on this side. They weren't opposite. They were on the same side of the issue. And, and um, so that's when I thought something's wrong. And it started bothering me. And then you know, I'd watch people and, and I'd hear people say they're voting for the lesser of two evils. And I said, why can't somebody good run? And then, then I, you know, just a regular person is not so crooked seeming. Then I started eventually thinking, you know what? You know, I was in the Air Force. I can say I was a veteran. I, I'm a person, you know. Why don't I do it, you know? And I had eventually, I joined the Libertarian Party. And I looked at the Green Party and the Libertarian Party. And the Libertarian Party was, of the views I've established, they were probably more in line with. And uh, so I joined them. And all right. Is that one of your signs? Yes, it is. Uh, I couldn't find one of my older ones. Um, okay. We got this, and then to, for the other craziness, we're get we're get we can talk politics a little bit. But but I um, uh, mostly ran on the this issue when I ran the first time I ran. It was night or in two thousand two thousand eleven when the World Trade Center got hit. Right? Was that two thousand two thousand one two thousand one. When the World Trade Center, I knew there. Were, I got almost the right numbers in there. <laughs> you got um, you got three I'm out of four digits, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's close enough. And uh, I knew I had no chance at winning. I, Eddie Perez was the Democrat, and uh, Mike McGarry was the Republican, who also had no chance because it's Hartford only the Democrat's going to win. But what I knew is I I'd been following the marijuana thing, and I wasn't like really a big pothead or anything, but I kind of because I was a jock and stuff, so, but I kind of thought, even if marijuana is bad, it can't be as bad as the war on drugs. And I remember, um, I, uh, well, it was just all kinds of damaging things, and I thought every, all the things we hear from the TV commercials is all negative about marijuana. So I thought, if I run for mayor of Hartford, I'm going to get a lot of press, and I'm just going to argue how good it, marijuana is. And so I, I was virtually a one-issue candidate, even though it's really I'm not a one-issue person in, on that on politics. But I I figured there was there was other people arguing for for gun rights for the not really gun rights but people's right to own guns. Well, and, I want to going to speed this along a little bit here. Sure. I want to just jump to more most recently you ran for U.S. Senate. Yes, you know, as a Did libertarian uh, yeah. uh, last year. Yeah. Oh God. I'll, and you got. Yeah, no, libertarian a U.S. You got uh, one of my bumper stickers. You got. Uh, I understand you got close to twenty thousand votes statewide. I forget something like that. And uh, what what is uh, Rich? Just very briefly, very brief sketch. I think a lot of people, including myself, <clears throat> aren't really clear on what are what are some of the other than gun control and marijuana. What are some of the key positions? on the issues that libertarians have. Well, Let's talk about the military, for well, instance. Yeah, I, I have strong opinions on cutting military expenses. And I, I was a veteran, and, and uh, um, I've kind of learned a lot of things, I guess. And, and, I, and I've 
discovered that sometimes uh, we spend money on stuff we don't need. And sometimes the Air Force doesn't even want some of the planes they get forced to get. Uh, the Army doesn't want a bunch of the Army tanks. They're, they're saying, no, we don't need any more. But, and the Congress said, no, you're getting more tanks. And, and they park them in the desert. Well, what, what, do you, what do you say to people? There, there have been certain people in recent mm -hmm. elections, as you yep. well know, who claim that we have a, a weak military, yeah. um, uh, our, our, an ineffective military. Yeah. What, what, are, what, what can you tell me very quickly? Yeah, my notes. Bullet, what, what, what <laughs> was the uh, U.S. <coughs> military budget last year? Oh, it was about as big as the rest of the planet. I don't remember exactly the numbers. But it's much more than any other country. How many aircraft carriers does the United States have? Here's my notes. We have 11 in service, two on reserve, and one under construction. Well, what country is second? Um, United Kingdom has two under construction, almost, but at least one is in service. China has two, but, but that's not even a fair uh, analogy because the, the aircraft carriers, the Queen of or they call them the Queen Elizabeth class that Britain has, the two new ones, are far superior to that which China has or Russia has. The Chinese aircraft carry, and if ours holds 90 aircraft, China's so, and Russia's hold 30. So one of ours is three times the size as theirs. So if you crunch all the numbers, crunching all the numbers, <clears throat> the, and you've done your research, I can I see bet. that you've done your homework, crunching all the numbers, stacking the United States military, up against there's, Russia, there's China. No threat. What, what, China's are, are, and Russia's aircraft carriers are so, so small that the, the airplanes cannot get enough speed to get off the ground if they have both full fuel tanks and all the weapons. They either have to have less fuel or less weapons or a combination just to get off the aircraft carrier. So, so they either have to give up some other weapons or give up on fuel. So less money on the military could mean more money for, for domestic Your spending too. and for infrastructure and yeah. for uh, oh, education you and use stuff. Your money for. Or just less money. F it could mean less money for the billionaires who are the ones who profit from war. And, and I'm convinced okay. they, that we are kept at war for the really. profit of the billionaires. Well, let, let me ask you. We've got to wrap this up. Just one final quick question. Sure. Make it easy. <laughs> Your college, pro football, Amer uh, U.S. Air Force, uh, stand-up comedy, politician, you've dabbled in so many. What, what, what's the, what would you say is the biggest lesson? What's the, what have you learned? Um, I think one thing that I kind of uh, uh, su subscribe to is a Buddha statement is uh, don't believe anything you hear no matter who tells you even if it's me unless it makes sense to you so it doesn't matter who tells me something if it doesn't make sense to me I, I don't um, necessarily buy into it Rich and Lyon so, thank you very much thank you if we really enjoyed that it was a great uh, I hope you enjoyed sh sharing Richard's uh, journey fascinating and uh rich if people want to um anybody who is interested in anything that you've talked about do you have a, a, a website well, my website for my politics is richardlion.com and lion is spelled l-i-o-n like the cat and okay. i also make fishing lures so we can go to venus Royal fishing com. lures yeah. stand-up comedy um, any questions they can get you at that email yeah my my uh because i may run for senate again and uh so richardlion.com and it has 14 issues that you might enjoy reading very it's good. not a very flashy website but it's intellectual i think thank you thanks again bye-bye mm -hmm.